Good morning, everybody. It's Kip Tesort with Chronicles of a Culture Changer. Here I am sporting my Arkansas EMT Association uh, shirt that I got last week when I was there at their conference. And uh, basically what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about a subject we've actually covered multiple times at DT4 EMS LLC. We've had it in our forum since like 2004, and then we've wrote multiple articles. I've even done some articles with, some, with a nationally recognized EMS admin that have been published in some of the uh, trade publications regarding arming staff. So here's the deal. You're going to get to hear it from me uh, with what I have to say and with what our company policy is about to arming staff. First of all, Kip T. Swart, the founder of DT4 EMS, the person who turns around and has researched and studied the assaults on EMS providers probably more than anybody else uh, in the country. What we do is study specifically and talk and train. And so we, we try to find out why this stuff is going on. So with that, being a subject matter expert with this type of stuff, what I want to say is this. I am not anti-arming anybody. I am a proud uh, concealed carry kind of a guy and I'm all about it. However, I am not pro-arming EMS either. And here's why. Let me explain. We have some issues with the way that, uh, uh, that there's just this jump, jump to the gun, so to speak. So without all of the training that goes in between nothing, which is what many places we're giving our staff right now, nothing, and then a firearm, you're not, you're not addressing everything that's in between. Not every encounter on a provider is lethal in nature, but because the media covers the fatalities, many people have a mistaken belief that that's all that exists. Here's the issue. If we jump just to the gun without all of the other stuff and the other options that are in between a gun, again, not saying a gun is not an option, I'm telling you it is an option, but it's the last option. So if we jump to uh, that, it would be the same as uh, removing every airway tool, every airway device from your ambulance, from the ED, except a surgical crite kit. That means your surgical crite kit will handle every single airway problem you ever face. No nasal cannula, no non-rebreather, no ET tube, no combi tube, no nothing except a surgical crite. So if a person is remotely short of breath, you have to shoot them, which is you have to crike them. So get to the fact of understanding. That's what we're saying. We're saying that, yes, we believe violence is a huge issue. We believe a threat to providers is also an issue. The, the, there is a potential for life-threatening situations. However, they are rare in comparison to everything else that goes on. So we need to consider some stuff. So that's the first thing, is force options. Think of it like that. If you give a firearm or decide to carry a firearm yourself on duty without having any other option in between, then the firearm becomes the proverbial uh, surgical crite kit and you have no other choice but that. So with that being said, let's talk a minute about weapon retention. So weapon retention, I'm not familiar with, and there may be some of that that exists, but I carried a gun uh, you know, for 17 years, and I'm not familiar with any concealable holster that provides a, a serious level of security like a, a security holster here, like you would see law enforcement wear. And what that means is, if, if I bring it a little closer here, that there are multiple things that have to happen in order for this weapon to be able to be removed from the holster. So if I got into some sort of a grappling situation and was wrestling with someone by surprise, which is the way most attacks happen on providers, uh, that, that this weapon doesn't, doesn't fall or come out. Well, guess what? This has to be worn outside. This has to be, you know, covered on a big belt. You know, it's kind of bulky. And I, again, I'm not familiar with any that, um, uh, that are concealable, that are that are out there. There might be some, I just don't know of any. So let's say, for instance, you've decided to uh, carry on duty and you uh, didn't practice any type of weapon retention. So that needs to be the thing. So what kind of holster, what are you going to do for retention is a, is a question. Again, it's a question. So retention. If you end up losing, and I'm taking it off camera so bad guys can't see how we take this out. If we end up losing possession of your firearm, right? So you no longer have possession of your firearm. So we all see that it's empty. If you lose possession of this and the person has it, the bad guy has it, are you going to practice on weapon disarming? In other words, how are you going to get your gun back if it falls out or is taken out? So you better practice. That's a whole other piece to this puzzle that we have. Then the next question that we ask, so see it doesn't come out of this unless you know the, the combination. So the next question then is, um, who is going to say what you're going to carry? Most police departments across the country, when a person is carrying an authorized firearm, they have to have a certain firearm. Even some of the smaller departments still say what an officer can carry, particularly the calibers, and it has to be, you know, a, a specific, you know, level of pistol, not just uh, or firearm, I should say, not just any 
you know, low dollar, 20 something, you know, uh, small caliber thing that once you shoot somebody, the main thing it does is piss them off. So if you're going to use it to stop a threat, it needs to be a caliber to stop a threat. Well, who's going to, who's going to say who does what? And, uh, uh, as far as what you're going to carry, then you need to look at it from and say, uh, what type of bullet are we going to use? And then what about the training that goes on with that? Are we going to train every quarter and who's going to pay for it? Who's going to do the qualification? Because what you're talking about is high liability uh, situations. And many of you are probably already aware of a case and whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, that's not what we're here to discuss. I just want to prove a point that there was a case in South Florida where, a, or not necessarily South Florida, but in Florida where a person uh, uh, used a firearm in what he claimed to be self-defense was not originally arrested and uh, was found not guilty uh, or however, you know, played out whether it was, you know, but I, I, my point is this, he didn't uh, get sentenced to any jail time, was not found guilty of any crime, was released, but yet the court of public opinion has followed this person. He can't even get stopped without a, um, a, uh, a making national headlines now. So there are multiple things to this about that, you know, with the carrying the firearm on duty. Again, not saying we're anti-arming, not saying we're pro-arming. We're just saying if you address these issues, then I will remove my reservations. I'm not saying I'm happy about it. I'm just saying that we'll remove our reservations. So the next thing is uh, concealed weapon carry classes. Guys, that is just enough to carry a gun concealed when you're off duty. That has nothing to do with entering into a scene with uh, uh, unknowns, meaning we get called all the time to unknown medicals that turn out to be something completely different. We find ourselves in the middle of a domestic. We find ourselves in the middle of a, uh, of a, of a drunken or a drug situation where you know we should be backing out of. Uh, are we going to start carrying that handgun and then maybe enter in or remain upon places too long that we shouldn't have because we have a sense of security, whether it's false or real, based upon the fact that you now have a gun on? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you will respond. I don't know how others will respond. What I'm saying is, is that these are questions that must be asked if you're going to consider carrying a firearm on duty. Uh, something that people aren't really discussing is why not have uh, the options of less lethal things as well, like a pepper spray, uh, what about a firearm, I'm sorry, a baton, um, you know, something else, even, you know, even a taser. But every tool has limitations because no tool, no tactic, no technique is 100%. So if you're serious about wanting to carry a firearm on duty, I need you to focus on the probabilities, not just the possibilities, and I need you to think about things like force options. What else is available? Is it just going to be the firearms? So everything is the, it's the, you know, every problem is going to become a nail. So the firearm is going to become the proverbial hammer. It's the same as giving them a surgical, it's the surgical crike. No other airway device is available. Nothing, just a surgical crike to handle all airway problems. Then you have weapon retention, weapon disarming, Who's going to mandate what can be carried? What is going to be carried? Uh, is it going to be inside or outside? So is it going to be concealed and not concealed? So are you going to have a, a retention holster or not? Guys, this is just a huge subject that, again, we have addressed multiple times. So if you're an administrator looking at this, uh, I, I strongly urge you get with your risk management, get with your legal department, and, and research these, op these, these uh, options that, that are there and understand that there are multiple things that you need to look at, not just whether or not a concealed permit is enough to allow someone to carry on the job. And on, as far as carrying on the job in an ambulance, I need you, if you're the person considering it, please think of these things as well and understand that before you just strap that gun on and carry it on duty, that, that like we were taught in law enforcement, that every scene I entered from here on out, there was always going to be at least one gun on that scene. And that gun was mine or the officer's weapon that, you know, that you're carrying. And so we know that officers uh, have been killed by their own firearms on duty uh, when they've lost control of that firearm. So if you're going to carry it, just make sure that you practice weapon retention and weapon disarming. Those are whole other training options and training issues with carrying a gun on duty because it's different than carrying a gun and walking a trail. It's different than carrying that gun and being seated in a restaurant or in your home or at the park because there you're, you know, you're aware of your safety and, you know, things that are going on. When we carry a gun on duty, we have a focus that is different. We show up thinking of patient care. So if you've studied our race to react, which is based upon Colonel John Boyd's OODA loop, you understand that our focus is different for a minute. And as, as humans, we can be aware of a bunch of stuff, but we can really only focus on one for that moment in time. Anyway, this has been kind of long. Uh, there are several uh, blog posts about arming EMS fire and ED staff uh, on our uh, www.dt4ems.com website. Uh, just look at the blog safety articles and you'll see where we've said these very things here that we're talking about. So with that, it's been a long one. I apologize. We'll talk to you later.